really long. Because that's the only time phones get away. Yeah. <laughs> Susan, you all know the Yes, I right said off. that twice. Thank you, my friend. Yeah. Working on it. <laughs> Well, welcome to another edition of Jazz and Self-Determination. This is the classroom edition, which is the same as the panel discussion, except that sometimes the discussions are held downstairs, sometimes they're held up here. But they both serve the function of um, continuing the learning experience process within education where people actually involved in art in its different forms, uh, talk about what they do, which is always a helpful experience for students and people taking in art and how it's done and how it's constructed, especially in the social sense. And um, I'm very appreciative of people that are here right now. They came to mind instantly when I said, let me do something about workshops, people who do workshops and people involved in art in a functional way as far as education as well. And um, uh, these three, three people will, uh, well, three to come, but two are here now. Uh, and I'm appreciative about that. Chris Chalfant, pianist, composer, educator, organizer of festivals, participant in many festivals, and she has some uh, memorabilia to illustrate the history of things. I remember it can all come of up that afterwards. too. <laughs> Stork Music Festival, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. This is in Boston. Right on. Yeah. Judith Ensel, violist, composer, educator, organizer, thinker, and um, I learn a great deal from her all the time. And I'm appreciative. I've, we made some good music together as well. And um, thanks to all of you for being here as well. And um, I'll ask a few questions, but it's just mostly going to be them talking, exchanging, presenting, and exchanging, in, alternating, uh, in an alternating manner. And, uh, we do, I usually do document these classes, but only the uh, presenters are on the film. I like to say that at the beginning, just in case there's some concerns about that. But um, and of course, everyone gets a, a copy. I appreciate that. And, and Chris, what are, you, uh, are your beginnings in music? And where are you from? You're from the Boston area originally? I'm from Akron, Ohio. Akron, Ohio, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now, your musical experience started in Akron. Mm hmm On piano? Yeah, yeah. singing, our, our lifestyle was singing and dancing, mm -hmm. theater. And I got into piano, I was the youngest. You know, my, my three of my grandparents played piano. My mother and her sisters learned piano, my sisters did. And mm -hmm. So I kept with it. It was the first thing I was better than anyone else at. So I kept <laughs> with it. <laughs> yeah. That's that's yeah. really great. Um, was it jazz or? I did improvise. You know, my mother said I was always making stuff up. I don't really remember it, but I I was never good at memory, so I would just improvise. You know, I'd be playing some Bach for yeah. my at her family events and like get lost. I just keep playing. So <laughs> that's a yeah, that experience, right? Yeah. Jazz, yeah. You know, and and I um, you know I, I sang in choir and musicals and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. You know. And you went from Akron, Ohio, requires you sing also. I forgot to... Yeah, I sing. Crystal, sorry about that. I left that out <laughs> in my introduction. <laughs> the voice is the first instrument, so that's important, too. So, um, yeah. And um, from Akron, Ohio, you went to the Boston area. Yes. So yeah. uh, when I graduated from music school at Kent State, um, you know, I had studied piano with a great teacher, um, but I just had trouble memorizing. I just couldn't imagine spending so much time 
learning Mozart and then having memory slips in the middle of it just <laughs> makes sense to me. But um, I was very inspired by a particular live record by um, Chickory and Herbie Hancock. Um, you know that record? Yeah, I was very inspired. You know, they put some classical music in it, some bar talk, and BBC or whatever was on it. And I was you inspired. Made a voyage, right? I was, what's that? Then they do Maiden Voyage on that record, right? Don't they? That's a different it's one. Is a duo, it was a yeah. concert. I don't remember, but okay. um, you know, I did, But that's what I listened to. I was inspiring, and I I took a workshop in Delco's Eurythmics in Columbus, and found this program at Longy School in Cambridge, and um, you know, that's what I did. I, I learned improvisation there formally, and my teacher was a classical musician, so it wasn't jazz at the time, but. You know, it was great. We had a group for seven years. We played in the concert hall every Wednesday. It was all the, I was the only one not in the faculty at first, but I became faculty. And, um, you know, Abby Rabinowitz on flute, who was in the Klezmer Conservatory right. band, and Taki Masuko was a tabla player. And um, so we built her on violin. Do you know her? Um, and some, some other people, and so that was really nice because it was free, we didn't, like we would create structures, but then um, we'd do it, and then we wouldn't do anything else with it. It was all about just continuing ideas and, you know, exploring, not, not etching things in stone, you know. Um, and we worked a lot on ensemble. There were, we did have a director, but she was more of a facilitator. But we, we part of it was, working with ensemble, you know. It was mostly, it was largely <coughs> women, actually. Um, I have a flyer somewhere. But that, yeah, so I did that, and then I kind of fell into graduate school by accident when I had a back injury. And I was, oh, somebody told me about this program called Third Stream, and I crawled over to the conservatory and got in it. And, <laughs> you know, and so that, that actually started that whole, whole thing. But I was, at that point, I was pretty, Involved in I was doing all these structured improvisations. I had met Sun Ra and Cecil by then, and um, you know I was I was very interested in combining this classical and in jazz improvisation kind of idea, you know, and so so we did a lot of that. We, I had a chamber jazz group, and um, uh, I did a lot of avant-garde stuff, um, performance art, that kind of thing. And then, and then, you know, just getting into the more of the jazz world as I met more people in New York, I just kept coming to New York more to the point here and, and got into the scene that you and I are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all the music plays a part. Um, you know, I asked about that. I wasn't uh, isolating that particular genre because I know it's all, uh, it all plays a part. Development, mm -hmm. which probably leads into another conversation about uh, the terminologies they put on on music because they don't always oh, know. capture oh, I know. the totality of, of what that is, you know. Yeah, and I mean there are these yeah. <laughs> these crazy notions, you know, being in, and the, I know you can relate. Are you Mariposa? Yes, I am. Hi. Hi. You've just been joined by Mariposa <laughs> Fernandez. Hello, sorry. Board educator, organizer. <laughs> I got Thank on the you. wrong train. <laughs> That's all right. You came right on time. <laughs> we haven't been talking that long. Judith A. Self, Chris Chalfant. But I wanted to say something, and I, I know that you can relate, and those of you have been around for a while. So when I was in Cambridge, and I was involved with the University Greenwood Conservatory and Longy School, and you know, classical musicians, new music, concerts, you know, you. He spoke when you spoke about the music it was more about like showing your self importance by what you knew instead of just appreciating the music like in a jazz you know whatever but th the word improvisation was like you didn't you were not a valid musician if you improvised and i said this is crazy so what i would do is in a concert i would 
put a title down in the program. This is all classical music in the concert. And I just put a score, some score on the piano, and then just completely improvised what I was doing. And that was the only, you know, that was the only reason that it was accepted, is if I, I named it and pretended like I was reading music. Okay. <laughs> That experience that you just outlined uh, was after you, when you came to Boston, you had that experience. In Boston. In Boston. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. right. In fact, there's this one composition called Portraits. Um, and um, so I, I actually, that piece, I there's a, a competition in Louisville, a uh, composer's competition. They needed a score. So I just like sketched the feel of it. You know, like I had all these doodads and, you know, just like, oh, I want the energy to be like this. And then, you know, the rhythms are kind of like this. And, it, you know, it's like I did it in like two days, entered in the competition, got, I was like merit finalist. And then it ended up in Teresa Sauer's Notations 21. And, I mean, it was a structured improvisation and it was different every time. You know, I had certain thematic material. Um, but it was an improvisation. It came from just experimenting, and it was always different. But then you had a different experience after that, um, coming across an educational context where they were more open, right? As opposed to uh, looking down on improvisation, did you come across that within the educational system? A more open approach later on up the road? Well, so it, when I was in um, in the 80s, um, I proposed a course called Discovering Improvisation. And that course was designed for advanced classical musicians who they didn't have to have experience in improvisation. And the whole point of it was to show that anybody can improvise, you know. And to, to kind of break that down, it's like you can still make music. And we take, we would, this, I had one class, I had um, string, like a string quartet. They were the students. And so we would look at string quartets and we'd use them as templates and then create pieces, write a name, do it in the concert, you know. Um, but, you know, that was the first time the New England Conservatory Extension Division and Prep Department had any improvisation. I mean, they had the third string program in the college, but they never had improvisation. Okay. They never had improvisation at Longy School, and Longy eventually got the contemporary improvisation program. So th this was all before that. Okay. And uh, we'll definitely get continue the uh, <laughs> your life story cycle in the cycle. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Professor Judith Insel. I'm, I'm not a professor, first of all. Yes, she is. <laughs> Great thinker, educator, violist, composer, organizer. And uh, what were your beginnings in, in music? Well, my beginnings are very New York urban oriented. I started in the fifth grade with the assignment of the viola assigned to me in my middle school so this was not planned out <laughs> okay so uh everybody in our school i lucked out and i ended up at a school in the bronx i am from the bronx so i've been here my whole life and uh ended up in a school that was very heavily into music so luckily we had these three directors of the borough wides that actually taught in our school. So the director of the borough-wide orchestra, borough-wide band, and borough-wide chorus. So they were all in my same middle school. Mm. Wow. And it was the Pablo Casals <laughs> IS-181 middle school, so inter inter intermediate school. Uh, so I remember we had to all go and get assigned instruments so we could try to pick them or uh, I remember my dad literally saying to me, well, you have to play the cello because it's Pablo Casals school. <laughs> I said to him, um, uh, okay, which actually was kind of the way I get through life. I just usually do whatever I want. 
So I told him okay, and I thought, no, I better play either flute or violin. Right so, I, so I show up, and I had to get to the orchestra room for the string assignments. And I get there, and there's all of these kids online. There's like a row one, row two, row three. And it took me a while to get there, so I was put on row three. Mm -hmm. So row three, I'm just standing there. One of my best friends is on the same row. So the orchestra conductor comes down the row, and he says, row one, violin. Row oh. two, violin. <laughs> row three, viola. <laughs> OK? So I look at one of my friends, and I was like, what's a viola? <laughs> And she was like, I don't know. And I said, I guess we're going to find out. So that's how I started as a violist. That was a complete act of fate. But it was one of the best things that's ever happened to me in my entire life. So from there, I, you know, as I said, we had these very active directors in our school. So they were very, very supportive of kids playing their instrument. They very much encourage you to go on and be in these groups. So we all went to Bronx Orchestra, so the Borough White Orchestra Band or Chorus. Uh, it was almost like you were an outcast if you didn't go to one of those things. So it was part of the school culture. So you, you did that, and another part of the school culture was to make sure that you apply to either music and art high school or performing arts high school. So if you didn't, again, there was something wrong with you. <laughs> so, so because there was such a push for the kids to be really heavily involved with music there. So I remember once again, there's my dad <laughs> saying, it's like, I want you to go to Hunter. <laughs> so here's my dad was like a mathematician and Okay. That was his thing, and Ooh. so I said, well, I'm not really interested in going to Hunter High School. And he was like, well, maybe not. Your math's not that great. <laughs> 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 so, I like, so, <laughs> so I was like, all right. Yeah, At least he understands sense. that part of it. <laughs> so I went on to, you know, my parents were very supportive. They got me private lessons on viola. Um, I ended up auditioning for both of those schools. I got into both. Then there was this whole discussion about which one I was going to. And to, at that point, the school, the two schools were not joined together, but they came together. And as we were auditioning, we found out that the year after we would come in, that they would come together and become LaGuardia High School that it is today. So, um, so I thought it doesn't really matter which one I go to. I'm going to end up with the same people anyway. So once again, to try to appease my father, I said, okay, I'll go to music and art because it supposedly had more academics. So, so, so I mean, not to like labor on this, but the whole thing is this kind of a life story events. Went there, had a great teacher, Professor Paula Washington, wonderful woman, pushed me like crazy to be a better violist. Uh, told me where I could get lessons with an amazing teacher named Ann Rogan. I went to Third Street Music School Settlement, um, and I should mention that when I was in the eighth grade getting ready for going into uh, these auditions, I ended up getting a scholarship to, the, to go to the Bronx House School, School of Music. So as, like, as far as the, the full-on like public school music experience, I've had it because I went to at least two of the major community music schools in New York City that get private lessons. So I ended up at Third Street, had a great teacher. My mom ended up knowing this person whose son had gone to Juilliard pre-college. Uh, luckily, her colleague said to her, this is what you have to do if she really wants to be musician and I think at that point it was very clear that I wanted to be one. Uh, again, it was almost like I'm doing this better than everybody else. <laughs> so I, maybe I should actually do this for real. So uh, so found out what the requirements were to get into Juilliard pre-college and Anne was so great. She helped me to prepare for that audition. 
So I got into Juilliard pre-college. I was there for my junior and senior year. And of course, there's the auditions to go into the next step of your life. So uh, audition at conservatories, ended up in Manhattan School of Music. So this is where it gets a little interesting. <laughs> because when I got to MSM, MSM was just really starting to get their jazz program going. So here I was, there was this classical violist, I'm classically trained, I'm going, playing orchestra, chamber music, taking my lessons and everything. Had like the most amazing teacher uh, in Emmanuel Vardy, who is like really the only violist who's ever played the Paganini Caprices on viola, if you've never heard yeah. that, it's <laughs> unbelievable. So um, he was a studio musician and he played in the NBC Orchestra when he was very young and he actually played on a lot of major recordings. If you hear like Jaco Pastore's court recordings with strings, he's in this action. <laughs> so it's like any major string uh, recordings in New York in the studio scene, he was in them. So he was already pretty progressive. So he was the kind of teacher where you'd come in and you'd say, well, you'd have kind of a discussion about what you were going to prepare, which was very unique in the classical world. As a string player, usually your teacher's like, here's what you're playing, and this is how you play it. Yes. yes. <laughs> so yeah. his approach was more like, and I just got lucky. I didn't know this was going to be his approach. His approach was, Come in and play what you want to play, and if I just think it's completely musically wrong, we'll talk about what you can do to change it. So I would come in and play all kinds of repertoire that I wanted to play, and it was a very freeing four years of undergrad because he didn't mandate me to do anything. I mean, the actually the only mandates I had were like, these are your graduation requirements, you have to play this on your recital kind of thing. Uh, whereas he was just like, do your thing. Um, I support what you're doing. And so I ended up doing a lot of things that most violists don't do. Like, a friend of mine was selling a trombone, and none of you guys know this year, I bought the trombone and I learned to play the trombone. Mm. So, and I sat in the jazz band, in one of the jazz bands on that trombone, because they needed players, and I thought, this is kind of fun, I think I'll give it a try. So, I, I didn't know, I haven't played trombone in a long time, I still have one, but in my undergrad, I did actually play a little bit in, in the third training jazz band, and then with that happening is when I started to think about playing jazz. Yeah. And then I actually took one of those kind of classes, like you said, for improv. It was called Jazz for Improv, and Jazz Improv for non-jazz majors. So it's funny, you show up to class, <coughs> there's a room full of string players, nobody else was taking that class. <laughs> it was pretty hilarious. Um, and the, the teacher for the class, his name was Bob Keller, he was a saxophone player. and. He would give us assignments like, go home and write a solo. Come in next week and we'll listen to you play the solo <laughs> over this, over these changes. And I was like, okay, I go home and write a solo. I come in and like violinists are playing all over <coughs> the instrument, every note they could find, up and down, every string. I was just like, wow, I hope I'm not going to fail this class because I'm not doing that. So I would get up there and I would play, and then Bob would say, everybody, I hope you're listening because this is more like what I want you to do. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta take some space, <laughs> and you have to make some phrasing out of it. But it was an interesting class because I had to, without really anybody's help, figure out how I wanted to do all kinds of phrasing and stuff on viola, because I really didn't have anybody to go to to ask those questions, so I kind of figured it out. And so with that, I just kind of kept going, and then by luck, once again, to 
pretty funny story. I had this boyfriend in my grad years there. I stayed on and did my grad degree. And I was starting studying orchestral playing. So, I mean, that was primarily my goal was to become an orchestral musician, but it didn't quite go that way. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it didn't go that way by choice, to be honest, because the more I started to do other kinds of music and other genres, I decided, actually, I don't want to be locked into a classical orchestra for the rest of my life. Mm. So um, basically, I ended up, long story short, in the Soldier String Quartet. And yeah. I was in it for seven years. Right. So I went on tour with Soldier String Quartet and John Cale, mm. and learned a lot. <laughs> and went around the world and realized I would rather kind of be, rather do this kind of stuff in addition to playing an orchestra. Mm -hmm. So kind of going through my career as a player, either I've been a studio musician for pop people or R&B, or I've done things where, where I've been hired to be in the string quartet that plays with like, Greg Osby or Absolutely. Lee Konitz or somebody who is playing, who's writing jazz music and wants to have strings and wants to have people that actually know how to play in the idiom, I'll end up there playing with them, which has been really great. And just coming up to today, eventually deciding to start my own band and to do my own music. And but at the same time, I'm still playing classical music all the time. I had a rehearsal last night. I'm in the Greenwich Symphony Orchestra. So there's no way I'm not playing all these different musics at the same time. Uh, I just remember years ago, somebody asked me like, who were my influences? And I was like, hmm, I have to really think about that. Uh -huh. But I would say my two greatest influences are Paul Hindemith and John Coltrane. Yeah. That was awesome. my, that was awesome. my influences, so that's basically who I am as a player. Yeah. So yeah. I can't separate classical, jazz, whatever. To me, it doesn't make any difference. Right. It's just improvising or playing whatever music the composer has put out. I I'm, I'm love doing it. I love playing, so that's what, what it's all about for me. I can, uh, yeah, I can understand that. That's so true. It's all... Uh, all connected, absolutely, and um, well, I and I, yeah. I just want to say one thing where, where Chris was talking about yeah. like it was so like taboo to be an improviser and everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, what when, when I decided to be like going on the road and in Silver String Quartet and and playing with John Cale, it was taboo just to have like a pickup on my viola, for God's sake. Because everybody was like, what is that? Why are you playing that weird music? And so you would go to like a classical gig, and I played tons of Broadway shows in my career, and you would show up, and literally, I, I have two violas for, for two reasons. One is because my a viola, as you would call it, my, my prize viola, when I was going to get a pickup on it, my luthier said, if you put the pickup on it, it's actually going to change the sound a little bit. Ooh. So you should get another viola and put it on there. Ooh. And then the other reason why is because I would go and play in like a Broadway show or an orchestra gig, and people would be giving me a vibe, like, why are you here with that pickup on your viola? <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Um, right. Are you really a trained classical musician? <laughs> Which was really uh, terrible. But that is no longer, um, you know, conservatory yeah. kids. There, that is no longer. Uh, this it's hard to find a string player at this point who does not yeah. play and have a pickup on yeah. and know how to improvise. This is the new world. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows that that's something a skill that they need. So Which this is different. It's totally different now, and the, you know, people are going on tours and playing with rock bands and whoever, and it's so not a big deal anymore. So I'm glad that the whole atmosphere has changed because at mm -hmm. first it was pretty bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you're one of the <coughs> primaries for that change, you know. So, yeah, I mean, I so guess so I was. Thing, I know? was even thinking about like the title of 
of your series is self-determination yeah. and like all the way through blink being an african-american woman from the bronx playing the viola and <laughs> playing it wherever and whatever i want has been an act of self-determination right. the whole way through it still is <laughs> that's why we we're here, that's why you're here, that's why you're here. <laughs> yes, right. Absolutely, absolutely. As I said a few minutes earlier, the people on the panel, they came to mind when I wanted to talk about this arts education in a functional way, yeah. workshop concepts in a functional way as far as social education through art. And, uh, I didn't even mention all the arts and education stuff. We'll get back to that. <laughs> we're going to go, we're going to start with the beginnings of your entry into art and then come right back to that. And you have another um, black woman involved in self determination, her fellow Bronxite. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, Judith. I, I feel more, even more proud. <laughs> to be from the Bronx and hearing your, your, your story. Um, and just to be up here with, with you also, Chris, and two women that are innovators and um, trailblazers in a lot of ways. Um, I have a lot in common with, with your story, um, coming from the Bronx, um, but also um, I went to LaGuardia. Oh, you did? Yeah. So I, I come from a traditional, um, Catholic, Puerto Rican family, and um, didn't really have, you know, going to a Catholic school, didn't really have the opportunity to be in that type of art environment. Um, and I didn't discover poetry or writing until later, um, but I love to draw. So I was very quiet, um, very quiet and very shy. And um, my entry into like the performance space and realizing that I loved being in front of an audience was actually um, reading in mass, doing the <laughs> reading, <laughs> the second reading, first reading. Um, uh, my dad would buy me um, art books um, at Shipman's on Grand Concourse. So I learned how to draw trees and I learned how to draw portraits. And I don't know. I think it was, I'm trying to remember who it was that encouraged me to apply to art and design and um, music and art um, and FIT. Um, but I, I think it was really actually my father. Um, and I remember a uh, really mean nun, uh, Sister Anne Marie Clancy, um, who has passed. I'm sure she's in a very warm place right now said, you're never going to get into any of those schools. Um, I was accepted to all three. And um, there was also a debate in my, in my family because I wanted to go to art and design, which was the real art school. Um, but my parents had heard that it was a druggy school, and they didn't want me around a bunch of artists, um, you know, smoking pot and whatnot. And that, that by that time, actually, I my class was the second entering freshman class of LaGuardia. Oh, yeah. So you were right behind. You. I was right behind you. Yeah. I um, and I remember that that the the decision was based on the fact that they had a better academic program. So when oh, you said that, right. Exactly. But of course, there were drugs there. Um, it was a druggy school because there were artists. Everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> um, so I was an art major. I was a fine arts major, um, which meant that I was a nerd uh, because only nerds were, um, were you know, art majors. So all my friends were in the music department, uh, in the drama department. And at that time, now in LaGuardia, you can double major. Um, but all my friends were uh, vocal, vocal majors, uh, instrumental uh, majors, or drama majors. So I was always in those departments, and I was always in, um, in, in those spaces, like dreaming of how I could one day be on a stage, but never really thinking that that could happen for me, but continuing to um, express myself as, as an artist. and. Um, my experience was one where I encountered a lot of racism um, in high school, where students of color were pushed 
into um, tracks. Um, my parents didn't I have the money to um, pay for um, private lessons to me. Um, so I didn't have that opportunity to uh, take advanced you know, oil painting and things of that nature. And then mm. the teachers actually uh, track the students of color, color into um, uh, professions like photography or um, printmaking, something more industrial. Um, so I, I remember that when I graduated, I, I didn't have as much confidence as I had when I when, when I came in, yeah. you know. Um, and I also remember um, I, I, I did um, choose photography as my elective, and one of my photographs was actually chosen to be exhibited in the State Museum in Albany. Mm -hmm. um, my working class parents um, were like, we're not driving up to Albany just to go look at your, <laughs> at your, at your photograph. Mm -hmm. um, which, which, yeah, I remember that. And I re also remember another um, teacher that, that um, Miss Dell, um, that used my photo, which was exhibited in this museum, as an example of, this is what you call a one-shot photographer. So mm -hmm. you have you know people that are really gifted, and then you have people that get that one good shot. And so I just, for me, it was like a brutal experience being in, in you know, in, in art school. Um, I was accepted um, to NYU, New York University, not the program of my choice. It wasn't Tisch School of the Arts, um, but it was an amazing program where fate would have it that I would meet Professor Mark Crawford, the late great Mark Crawford, um, and that's my 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 connection and um, our common connection. Um, so Mark Crawford was an adjunct. He was a jazz critic. Um, he taught creative writing and also this amazing class called Jazz Appreciation, where he brought uh, live musicians to us every week and um, just had a profound uh, impact on my life. Um, in college, the only creative writing course that I ever took was with him. So I, I consider myself to be more of an organic poet that came into um, that space, that performance space, just by being in the village and reading my poetry in smoky bars and University of the Streets mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and meeting other, uh, you know, revolutionary avant-garde um, literary figures like Pedro Pietri and, uh, and, and coming into that, um, that, that space. And then, and then later on, um, meeting other artists from the black arts movement like Enzozaki Shange and really developing close relationships with, with icons um, and, and finding myself, you know, finding my, myself into performance spaces through, through poetry and then and painting with words, you know. So the art, the visual, the the the, the imagery never left me. It just the medium changed. Um, and then meeting other other artists and collaborating with other artists like Ross. Um, so that was my how I just to, yes me too. <laughs> Been, yeah, grateful for that collaboration. It's been very fruitful. We're looking forward to more, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know what you just brought up um, probably leads into the next question about what you were saying about the social experiences you had and the family experiences you had as well. Um, you find, uh, what do you come across working with uh, people in, in the workshop concept? who probably have a similar experience. Um, do you feel that maybe because uh, something exists like a workshop, they find that maybe they can take refuge in, in that, you, you know, because um, maybe they're not finding it in other aspects of their life. That might not be the case with everybody, but um, it seems like the workshop concept is going to attract people coming from different kinds of spaces people who, who are artistically inclined but were encouraged to do it or weren't encouraged to do it? Um. I, think, I think so, and I think that's why it's important that those spaces continue to exist. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, back in the day, um, 
the, the Harlem Writers Guild produced, you know, amazing writers, you know, um, like, you know, not only African American writers, but uh, Nicola Zamor actually was one yes. of the writers from that emerged from 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 that, and uh, not from you know uh, obtaining an M an MFA. Right. Um, so I think that for um, a, a lot of uh, I mean, especially I think Latinos tend to come into the arts late later in life. Um, I may, that might be changing now, mm -hmm. uh, but I think that because of certain cultural norms and working class values and having parents that, you know, like your dad pushing you to go to Hunter High School and, you know, when math was not your calling, um, you know, uh, or in the, in the case of, of, of my parents, they were encouraging, but they were like, you're not you need to get, you're going to college so you can get a real job, you know, like you're not, you have to be able to pay the rent, you know, like that's not real work, you know, eso no es trabajo, you know, and so, <laughs> so, um, and even now, you know, the schedule that, you know, I, I, um, I teach at City College and, um, and Lehman as an adjunct, and I like my schedule so that I could have some space in my life or try to carve that space because you know we don't really get paid that much as adjuncts but uh, getting the question you know the regular question so are you working today I'm like I'm always working <laughs> you know I'm always working you know the other question that really like really um, astounds me is you know um, has to do with boredom like I never get bored <laughs> I'm an artist Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, if anything, just give me more time. Yes. I just, I feel like I don't have the time to do, mm -hmm. to create everything that I want to create. Right. Or, mm -hmm. or sometimes the energy level, right. you know, that's required. But no, it's, it's never like a, a question of boredom. Mm -hmm. You know, people, yeah. I'm referring to people that have, you know, traditional nine to five jobs that, right. you know, hate being home or can't, you know, would go crazy mm -hmm. um, if they didn't have, you know, an office to go to. I see. Right. <laughs> right. That's real. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And um, we move back around. And then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is such a great learning experience. Uh, hearing how uh, all these things contextualize the experience in art. And then how you pass that on to other people in your own work and stuff. And um, Chris, so from Boston, uh, did you start working in educational contexts within that time period? Um, yeah, right away I taught yeah. piano. Right. So I, I had my studio in 1984. You mentioned you created a curriculum too. Well, yeah, so my private studio was this okay. private piano, and actually that was a very interesting group of kids, and some of them had become um, professionals or working musicians in New York. They're still friends, you know, they were in the same studio when they were not even teenagers, you know, but we did a lot of creative work. Um, we, we wrote things together. I had workshops. I had Sid Smart do one of the workshops in drum making, and we did we did this theater piece when I produced American Women Composers. They they wrote the piece, they did the choreography, they wrote the song, they created the story, and you know. So I I found from an er, from early on in my teaching that there's a lot of value in teaching kids um, to activate their creativity in some way because uh, um, I use the phrase that they own their own learning. It's coming from them, so you're not just directing them. You know, some people need structure, but I have always found that um, in, empowering uh, young people to access their creativity is really, it's good for their self-esteem and for, you know, doing well in, in the world. I mean, I've had young students who ended up getting doctorates at Cornell. And, master's degrees and you know anyway so um, so I I've been teaching my whole career and um, I taught in the classroom 
so I, I taught at Manji School and I taught I taught music theory and solfege. Or actually, we didn't do solfege; we did numbers. But mm. ear sight singing and ear I don't know yeah. why. Um, but we did sight singing um, at, at New England Conservatory Prep Department. I I taught eurythmics um, to special needs kids, as they were called at that time, which is really interesting because that that's where I really felt the power of using creativity with these kids with spina bifida and, you know, um, ADHD, and, you know, like working, like I remember this one kid, he had trouble with transition, so we had to find ways of capturing, capturing what that was and how to, how to turn it into a creative activity, you know. Um, so when I came to New York, I, Became um, known as a um, expert in music and movement for preschool kids for some reason. Um, you know, it's like people didn't do that very much, and I got one job, and you know, I have worked for years all over Brooklyn Conservatory. I was there for a long time, and that was an interesting job because that I had two and a half to three year olds. And, I mean, these kids, I mean, they're amazing. You can, I never knew that a three-year-old could sing soulfish, but they can. Yes, I mean, I'm serious. Yes. They can if you have the yes. right curriculum. You, right. You, you guys are educators, mm -hmm. right? So it, it's really remarkable. And, and the, the, there, there wasn't that much music for that age to sing. So I wrote a lot of music. I, I had a, um, a plan for myself just to keep myself creatively engaged because I was working with such young students. Um, so every two weeks I would write a new song. I would wake up at 7.30 in the morning, I'd write it in the shower, I'd memorize it, I'd come up with a lesson plan, and then I'd start my class at 9.30 and I taught it. And I knew right then whether it was going to be a hit or not by the way the kids responded. And then, and then I created these um, collections of songs and, and printed. Uh, I did that for Brooklyn Conservatory and I did it for Greenwich House Music School. And I teach those songs today, you know. Um, so anyway, what was the question? <laughs> no, you, had, you answered it with my okay. closing well, uh, Just contextualized the right where I was going to ask. You know, and it was a nice uh, meeting. <laughs> Okay. into the, function, the functional aspects of passing on what you yourself have internalized. And, uh, yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I mean, yeah. when I was young, I actually was more involved in visual art than music when I was young. And I remember very distinctly my art teacher, Mrs. Miller, in first grade. And I would visit her at her house. But she was the first person who validated me that you know she she would look at my artwork and and you know she was very encouraging at, at you know continuing to create and there's just this feeling of I mean what I imparted to my students was based on this early experience of being validated and um, you know acknowledging that my creative being that comes from such a deep place and is from such a high place. You know, I consider as artists, we're vessels, you know, and that we have, we have, we just have this capability of being in a space that people are accountants. I mean, they, they probably are in that space, you know, at some point, but I mean, that's just kind of in our DNA is who we are is to be able to tap into that space. And when you're able to be in that space, you know, magic happens. And I was just watching an interview with um, Paul McCartney on Stephen Colbert last night. Yeah. You saw that? Yeah. And he said, you know, the what makes it all worth it is when you're able to connect with people, you're able to touch people. And I, I mean, I can tell you, you know, in performances, you know, I, I can feel I can, I can just feel how certain sounds, certain tones, like people don't understand the value of having a certain tone, you know. But you connect with people on a really deep level when you're able to have that, you 
know. So back to education, I mean, that's, you know, I, that's part of my teaching is accessing tone. I actually do color theory with my campus students. Like, mm -hmm. hey, take all the reds and, you know, like, Put them together in a sequence. Now, what's what's you know what's the tone of a Chinese red and a you know a, a, a Oriental carpet? You know the, that kind of red. Like what what's the tone? How can you produce that tone and get that feeling in your sound? You know, kids connect to that. Mm -hmm. Connect to that. Gets them in a deeper level of their music. Right. Did you have the same experience in? Because you were at the Hall School of Arts. Yeah, about how long ago? Um, well, not, not that long, long, like two and a half years. Yeah. But what brought me there was interesting. Like when I started to really start teaching, I was teaching at a community music school, so I started my education journey as, as a educator at the Bloomingdale School of Music. So I was there for like eight or nine years. And then I, I had my children. I have two children that um, a lot of people have no idea that I have two children, but somehow I managed to have two children along the way <laughs> and all the stuff that I was doing. So, so I'm, at this point, I have a 19-year-old and a 17-year-old. So when they were very young, I decided, well, you know, maybe I should be around more. And so I sort of stopped teaching for a couple of reasons at Bloomingdale. Not, no offense to the community music school network, but it just didn't pay enough for me to pay my babysitter to go and teach. Mm -hmm. So I decided that, okay, I'll just stay home. But I was also teaching at Juilliard Pre-College in the math program. Mm -hmm. So that was on Saturdays, and, and, and that was a very special program at the time where it was supposed to be a program where it filled the gap in what had happened to public school yeah. um, mm -hmm. um, music programs that had disintegrated. Mm -hmm. So basically, I felt like if I'm, if I'm gonna keep doing something and it's on a Saturday, I can keep doing that. And like you had, uh, I had some students who came through that program who actually went on to be professional violists, mm. which was great. I mean, the whole idea of, and I'm finding as I keep going on in this education cycle for me as an educator is I keep returning to the fact that I started in a public school program and there are kids that need that. Yes. And so I keep finding this reoccurring thing happening. So you mentioned Harlem School of the Arts, but before that, I actually was the assistant director of instrumental studies at Manus College Manus, of Music. Yeah. Okay. And I'm not talking about the prep division. I was working as the assistant right. for instrumental studies in the college. Mm -hmm. And I remember in that brief time I was there, literally saying to myself, this is not the right place for me. Not because I don't belong here, but everybody who is here as a student has reached the level that they needed to. I need to go and help the kids down below get to here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I realized that pretty quickly, and so I left. And then I was offered this opportunity to run the music department at Harlem School of the Arts, and I thought, this is where, more where I belong. This is where the kids need me to help them to get to those levels where you end up in the pre-colleges of conservatories and go on to college. So I, I evaluated what was really, what I felt like was my purpose as an educator. So I decided that at that point, I wasn't really teaching anymore and I t had, kind of made the change with that um, Manus position into more of an administrator. And I've kind of gone in that direction ever since, um, almost because, not that I don't like teaching, in fact, I enjoy teaching very much, 
but I also realized that teachers are not really the ones that make the decisions. <laughs> right. So I decided I need to go up to the levels up there to make some real difference. So at this point, I worked at Manus College, I run the music department at, at, at Harlem School of the Arts. I've even run an entire performing arts school at Bronx House, which was full circle for me because like I said, I was a student there. Right. So I went back and I ran that program, that whole school for a year. And now I'm working and I'm working at the Bronx Arts Ensemble as in a newly created position which is for curriculum and artist development, mm -hmm. which um, I had to make a decision. Do I leave Bronx House where I'm helping some kids mm -hmm. or with the Bronx Arts Ensemble, which actually has partner schools that usually average 45 to 50 schools a year, mm -hmm. realizing I will reach a lot more kids that yeah. way with my curriculum. Mm -hmm. So I decided to go to Bronx Arts Ensemble. Mm -hmm. So it was almost kind of like, as far as titles go, a step back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I was okay with that. Right. Um, because mm -hmm. in my work that I'm doing, at this point, I'm at the pr in the beginning stages process of writing <laughs> curriculum for about 80 to 90 teaching artists that go out to those 45 to 50 schools that teach all four arts disciplines, uh, music, dance, visual theater, and um, uh, music, dance, <laughs> visual arts, and theater, I should say. And the focuses are different from when, when I was in school. Um, it's a lot about social emotional learning. It's about actually social justice and restorative practices. Mm -hmm. It's a lot about advanced literacy skills and yeah. very much about culturally responsive learning and teaching. Yes. So these are the things that are current and also in line with the New York City Department of Education at this point. I think finally, at least under this leadership in the DOE here, that they have realized that the students are actually people. <laughs> <laughs> and so, as I relate yes. to my, my colleagues in Bronx Arts, that's all I'm like, I had to give a whole presentation about what I was working on. I finally said, I think they finally realized that students are people. They have intersectional identities. There's more to them than just a student. They identify in many ways and this is the work I'm doing now so I'm not exactly a teacher in the classroom I'm actually teaching all of these teachers how to teach in their classroom mm -hmm. so um, that's where I'm at, at this point and I think there's a lot that in my trying to put together this curriculum I've had to examine for myself uh, examining, like you said before, there was a lot of racial stereotyping that happened so far through my career. Yeah. Hopefully that there won't be as much as I go along, but as I said before, my self-determination got right. me to be here as an African-American woman yeah. to play a viola <laughs> and yeah. play whatever music I want. There were lots of roadblocks along the way mm -hmm. where people thought, well, you're not supposed to be playing this instrument and you're not supposed to be in this conservatory program. And I think even you're not supposed to be in this leadership role at all. <laughs> so, um, so that's really where my education experience has been. But most of all, when I look back and I think about it, it, it all keeps coming back to the fact that I want to help that those same kind of kids, like me, who went to public school, and if they hadn't had the exposure to any art form, it just wasn't gonna happen. <laughs> so I'm helping them to make that happen. Right, and that's kind of like you using the educational paradigm anyway, even though you 
in, a, in an administrative role, I'm sure you're utilizing that. Yeah. It's I kind mean, of like, yeah. I mean, we, it's the same dynamic in a way. I, I mean, with I, a different I, title, right? I, you know, I, I know there are some people that, that know, have no idea that I do all this education work and I've done all this administrative stuff. I just show up, I play my viola, and that's yeah. all they know about me. <laughs> but a good, goodly amount of my time is actually spent right. either being an, an education administrator or have been, has been as being a teacher. So um, it's, it's things that I enjoy. Uh, administratively, it's hard. There's a lot of roadblocks for kids of color, and, and no matter what subject you're trying to get them to be involved with, it's real. So I'm trying to help get rid of some of the roadblocks for them. Right. Yola and self determination. <laughs> right. <laughs> Just like that's right. And would you define your experience as having the same kind of? Uh, Dynamics that you just mentioned, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, as a as an educator, um, working with young people of color in New York City, um, yes, I. Well, I started as a teaching artist. Um, I actually I have my master's in bilingual special education, um, but I started as a as a teaching artist in the late '90s, uh, working with um, Teachers and Writers Collaborative, the Caribbean Cultural Center, um, Poets House, Poets and Writers, um, also going into senior citizen centers and working with, um, with, um, with uh, elders and, um, and facilitating workshops where they would tell their stories, and, um, which was great. But for the most part, um, working with students um, at that time, it was called District 75. Um, but I found that as a teaching artist that I had more freedom than working uh, for the DOE. Mm -hmm. I was very rebellious. Um, mm -hmm. I was very rebellious. I did, after after um, going through uh, my graduate program at NYU, I was like, no, I don't want to be beholden to the system, another cog in the wheel, uh, you know, not realizing that one day you know, you would want that, you know, those benefits. <laughs> 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 like I'm looking at friends of mine that are like, oh God, but it's, it's okay. I, I really have no regrets um, because of what I was able to learn and um, being able to, um, uh, Chris's story reminded me of, of um, just the resistance and the, the pessimism that I would um, that I would find among um, some some teachers like th these kids they're gonna write poetry they're not gonna write poetry for you mm. you know like they don't write for me you're never gonna get them to write poetry and, mm. um, and I would I would at, you know at the end of you know five six eight weeks um, have tons of poetry and just have <laughs> you know more more poetry than I knew what I what what to do with you know and I still had um, the an anthologies that I would that I would edit at the end of um, that the each residency would culminate with an anthology and a couple of years ago um, I ran into a young man at a nonprofit where um, uh, where I was working. I was doing some work for a nonprofit, and he said to me, he was like in his early 20s, and um, we got introduced, Mariposa, and the young man, I don't remember his name right now, but he said to me, did you teach in a school in bed -Stuy? This would have been around 10 years, 10 or 12 years ago, and I'm like, well, it depends, like which school, like, you know, I, I've, I've taught in many different yeah. schools. And he said, um, it was in bed -Stuy. And I remember um, a teacher, a poetry teacher, that looked so much like you, and she would say, and he quoted me, because what I say to the kids is, my name is Mariposa, which in Spanish means butterfly, because I'm butter and I'm fly. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been saying that for years. And he remembered it. And, he, and I couldn't believe it. So I went home, 
And uh, he told me what school in Bedside. I went home to my, my little collection. And I had a few copies of the anthology that I put together for, um, for his school. Uh, he was in the seventh grade. And I found his poetry. And he wrote poems about his hair. And, you know, and I remember thinking that, you know, being told or grow, growing up being told to have bello malo, you know, bad hair, that that was just something that, that, that little girls, you know, that, that little black girls went through, not boys, you know, mm -hmm. but he was writing those poems, mm -hmm. you know, 12, well now it's at least longer, but I was able to go back to that nonprofit with the anthology and give him a copy, which of course he, he didn't have at this, at this point. And he was just like, wow. he was just like amazed. Yeah. But it made me realize, because there are times when I, I, I would question, you know, what am I doing? Like, am I really making a difference? You know, um, being a teaching artist or not being a certified teacher and like having that type of relationship, which is also very important. Um, and I. I realized, yes, yes, mm -hmm. you know, um, and and I think that the work that we do is is, is invaluable, uh, which is why we need, um, why why we need not only the DOE but you know these cultural um, NGOs to continue to have those types of relationships, you know, and also, you know, there's I learned recently that there's a whole term for for you know it's called the orange economy. You know, mm -hmm. it's the, the economy um, of creativity, mm -hmm. of the arts and entrepreneurship. You know, artists need, uh, a lot of artists actually um, become educators um, yeah. so that they could, ask. it's partly out of necessity. Mm -hmm. I think it's also because a lot of us just have um, an ability to reach young people in a way that, um, you know, the, the, the teachers that they have every day can't mm -hmm. because we come mm -hmm. in and we can be the rock stars mm -hmm. and we can provide that space that, that they mm -hmm. need and give them a break. Um, but I think that I think that it's important that um, that, that we realize that that value, you know, and, and validate like like Chris was saying, you know, that validation. Because I remember mm -hmm. what that provided for me when someone noticed, you know, what I was doing and, and just you know, um, paid attention, yeah. you know, uh, even if it wasn't that great, but re realized the potential there and how that could be cultivated and, and that there's also like a craft involved that we need to help our students elevate, you know, especially now, today when you have YouTube and you know a lot of young people think that's all they need, that's all they need is their phone and YouTube, like there's no craft, there's no, there's no need to like get better or practice or find a mentor, find teachers, right. like learn how to like elevate it and take it to the next level. Mm -hmm. You know, that's still important too. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just about having, you know, a YouTube account and a, and a cell phone, mm -hmm. you know. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> YouTube items. <laughs> we recently in, in, in Puerto Rico doing uh, uh, workshops, right? Yes, I, I was in Puerto Rico this summer for two and a half months uh, uh, with the primary work was uh, rebuilding rooms with CUNY students mm -hmm. uh, in different parts of the island, in Yanagoa, yeah. in San Juan, uh, Orocovis, in the mountains. Uh, but during that time, um, I curated um, uh, poetry series, Barrio Poetics, Puerto Rico edition, and Barrio Poetics is, um, it's a, a, a poetry and um, art series that takes place uptown uh, in El Barrio, but we did it, we did it in Puerto Rico to create a space uh, for the students to connect with other young people, uh, and other artists too, not, you know, yeah. youth of all ages, <laughs> right, like us, right, right. Um, but yeah, so, uh, so, so, so we had Barrio Poetics. I, I um, put together a Barrio Poetics series um, yeah. that took place in June, July, and August in Puerto Rico. Wow. Yeah. That's, I mean, that was right on time. I'm sure it was functional, right, with everything that was happening. 
Oh, right with the revolution, time. with yes, Boricua summer and yes. all of that. Everything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right on. <laughs> <laughs> the ousting of a governor and yeah, yeah. it was really it was really incredible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We were watching that downstairs as it was happening. Oh, well, on the on the news. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was, you know, the whole resurgence, not that it ever stops, but there was like a resurgence of uh, social activity like the early in an earlier time period. I mean it never stops, but you know. But I guess the times will do that. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. in general. And um and you know, you worked uh not only that but with the uh your later musical endeavors uh, of education up to now, you know, you having the same experience when you find that type of fruitful experience on the people that you interact with and at this time now period. Is so now. different. I, mean, I also, you know, it depends on the population too. I mean, when I started teaching, I was teaching, you know, uh, these elite families, you know, where the kids play concertos when they're nine. Oh, you know? okay. <laughs> right, right. And, you know, I teach in East Harlem, um, and, you know, is different. You know, the, the parents don't have babysitters. You know, they can't afford babysitters, so the kid doesn't take a lesson if the, if the mother's sick or, right. you know, something's going on, you know. Um, so it's a different situation. Um, but in, in general, as far as the, the um, where we're at with how you teach, um, just, you know, regardless of the socioeconomic um, things, I'm finding What's interesting to me is now you actually can use YouTube as a source. I use YouTube in the lessons. Yeah. And I, I was just teaching somebody Monday, um, teaching him how to, how to learn by ear and to get the exact phrasing that the artist did. You know, it's like, oh, it's ba ba ba, you know, ba ba ba, or whatever it is. Like, listen to it, now play it, and say it. And, so you can you can use technology that yeah. we, you know what we have today that we didn't have even ten years so ago. Sure. You yes. know that you can use that in the classroom. You know I I send send you know videos. You know they learn them. I'll videotape the lesson. You know they have them play, especially the young kids. They can see their hands doing. Of course, like seeing themselves on video is really you know wow. You know take photos and you know all, the whole nine yards and, you know and if they don't have it yet then I'll 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 have them videotape me you know and, and just having them engage oh like let me you know let, no, let's do it again you know right. do I have the right look I mean it, <laughs> it's just it, I never taught like that you know it, it's like you know there was a way that you taught in the conservatory it was there was only one way to do well there was yeah, different schools, but you you know, if you were in the Lechitsky School of Piano, this is how you taught, you know, and the, so you could map the lineage of that European system of right. playing piano, right? Um, so it, it's so different. I mean, in jazz, lineage is you know means something different. You know, it's like a, it's alive. Like how did you know, you can hear oh, of so and so place like that. You know that they listen to Coltrane. They they listen to, you know, you know Billy listen to Bessie Smith, and you know you you can hear in that way. But in the conservatory world, it's different. You know, it's um, it's kind of an elite closed society. Would you say that? I, I don't know. Yeah. You know, it's like the world at large would know that stuff. Right. That's true. Right. But it's it is like a music school. So it's, these are things that you do. But it's like, but this is America, you know. It, it's it's like there's not you can't just say the French school or the Russian school. It's like we are a conglomeration of people that come from all over the place. And you know, for so long, even like composers, you know, when Boulez came to New York to take over the New York Philharmonic, part of his mission was to cut this idea that you had to had the Schoenbergian kind of lineage of composition to be taken seriously. And, you know, you know, having Philip Glass do Satyagraha in 71 at the Met, and, you know, the 
starting to break, but Boulez actually left because he was frustrated that it wasn't breaking, you know. But you have these, you have these European ideas of how music should be, and today it, it's, you know, it, there's still a split. Large, I mean, it, it is changing. You're saying like today, it is, you know, it, it, it is changing. Slowly. It's it's changing. Yeah, I think people today, like, you know, they they are expected to understand, you know, different, you know, a little bit about world music, or, you know, if you're Latin, whatever. Um, yeah, less I, I I'm not sure it's changing because only because they want to know other music so together. I think it also has to do with your orange economy thing. They need to, to work. Yeah. So if you want to work, you have to be able to do many different things. So that's what I've seen that, you know, if you are a violinist and all you can do is play classical music, you're not going to be working that much. Right. Because you have to be able to do all kinds of things. Um, if you're just doing traditional classical music, then, um, you know, if you get a phone call, and, and I know people who have, hey, come with me on the Beyonce tour, and then you end up on tour with Beyonce in her big orchestra, but they're not playing classical music, you better be able to feel the groove of what's going on, yeah. otherwise you're not getting this gig. So I, I've seen a lot of that happen over the years where, where um, students um, will express interests of doing or learning how to do or perform other types of music. They're interested in it, but they also know they, they want to work. <laughs> so right. they, they need to make a living. But there, there's a challenge. Um, a guy, I have this one student. He's very gifted. Um, um, I've, I've been fortunate to have students who, you know, who come from family, families of professional musicians, and they have certain kind of backgrounds. And, and this this one boy, I mean, he 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 has a real challenge just reading basic, like you know, primer level reading. But he can play changes. He you know he can he can listen to a record and. You know, he, he's a composer, you know, we did this piece together and like each week he comes in with a different variation and different feel like, you know, what do you think of this? You know, and like, where are you coming, you know? I, I don't know where these kids get this, you know? But they, they, they come in, they, they have a, a broader, they have a broader, broader soundscape, um, but, they still have to learn how to read, right? You know, and to impress that upon them when they—it's so easy just to play by ear, to improvise, to play in a certain style. You know, it's still they still need to know how to do craft and how to get better. Yeah. And educators need to be able to do that. Yeah. You know, because you have, you know, you have a, a somebody who graduated from Juilliard and. They try to teach piano lessons the way that we learn. You know, it's like they're not going to succeed. Mm. They won't. Okay. You know, small, a small. It's becoming a smaller and smaller um, population of that road. I mean, you you have to keep up with educational trends. So I think that has a lot to do with it as well. Um, coming from also, I think, at least as far as the average student who's learning music, and I mean, they're also getting a general education, and I, like I mentioned, I have those two kids. I, I've been kind of, over their educational career, actually tracking what they learn academically, and what, what they are learning as their growing up to be actual adults, it's so much broader than what I remember having when I was in middle school, high school, um, down to the discussion of what is your identity? 
we, we didn't have those discussions when, when back then about like what is your sexual identity? What is your <laughs> preferred gender? Those are things that are discussed openly now in classrooms. So uh, already everything is wider open in that respect than ever before. What do you think led to, I'm sorry. Sure. What, what do you think led to it being wide open? What do you think that evolutionary process was, uh, what was that composed of, in your opinion? What led to it? I mean, it's a natural occurrence for things to get more open. Right. Uh, in different paradigms like that, but in reference to what you were just discussing, what, and what everybody just basically said that uh, comparing their experiences coming into the art and seeing the changes. What was your opinion about what opened things up? Well, I think, I mean, at least on like just a general education standpoint that um, whatever or whoever is deciding what the actual approaches are or the trends are for education, at, at least in New York City at the moment, it's quite progressive. So, uh, in this past spring with the mayor coming out and making an announcement that, oh, we are gonna have this social emotional learning initiative for the entire Department of Education, that's a major thing to be said. Again, it's going back to, okay, students are actually human beings <laughs> and they have, each individual has emotional, situations every single time you're in, in, in contact with them. They are just not a blank slate when they show up to school every day. Okay. There's a lot more going on outside of the classroom that is actually being uh, acknowledged, I think, for the first time um, and being addressed. And you know, I think there's been a gradual turn in that direction. I don't, I don't know if it was, it's almost like cart before the horse. I don't know whether with our society as a whole, accepting gender fluidity and identity, and then it forced the, the education system to address it, or if yeah. it was the other way around, the education system decided to address it, mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm climate change and all these other things that are relevant to the so-called progressive education mind. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. you know, my yeah. daughter, I distinctly remember like five or six years ago having a discussion with her, just randomly having a discussion with her, which turned into a discussion about sexual, sexuality and gender. And Ooh. she was 14 years old. And wow. she led that discussion, mm -hmm. not me. Mm -hmm. And I realized that that was because of the school environment that she was experiencing. Wow. They had yeah. addressed these issues. I, I mean, when she was in middle school, I tried to address the issues as much as you can. You know, like, you're their parent. They don't want to talk to you about that stuff. But all of a sudden, right. we ended up having a discussion mm -hmm. literally about the population of her school, what her sexual identity was, mm -hmm. what her sexual preference was, and that she literally told me that she felt that there was more than two genders, gender is fluid, <laughs> and that she was straight, but not necessarily makes any difference to her what anybody else thinks about her identity except for that, accept it, this is her identity. Right. So I didn't initiate that discussion. So that's when I started to realize <laughs> that the education system is going in that direction okay. and it has gradually been going in those directions and I think it's almost like, again, I still can't decide whether it's like reactionary or if it was ahead of the curve <laughs> that they decided to do this because you know when you have students who are going to be identifying in themselves in certain gender roles 
that might be non-traditional, what do you do? Right. What do you do? You either ignore it, yeah. accept it, address it, but what do you do? And it seems that now the trend is to address it and accept it. So to me, that means that like all these other directions are more open. Yeah. Even with like music education, there's just more openness across the board mm -hmm. because there's just more of an open and progressive feeling yeah. to it. And I, I hope that it continues that way <laughs> because once we get a new mayor, which everybody always forgets that he is the person in charge of the education system mm -hmm. for public school in this city, it will depend on whether that next person decides to keep going in that trend. Yeah. Um, it was very much the opposite when we had Mayor Bloomberg. Mm -hmm. It was not like that at all. Mm -hmm. So I've seen a real... <laughs> you're right. <laughs> so I, I I've seen that there, there was there was a real more progressive shift yeah. when uh, Mayor De Blasio came on and decided uh -huh. to run his Department of Education in a totally different way than before. So that's what I'm saying. I feel like in general, the the students at least K through 12 are just more open and progressive in this city overall the ones that go through the public school system and that kind of spills into the arts education too. I find a, in a larger scope that education, um, it, it goes through different waves. Like there, there are points where administrations are coming from the top, you know, the, the, they pull everything together and it becomes testing based. And then people say, no, testing is leaving people out. So then they start leaving more space for people to have more creativity and learn in different ways. And you know, that's one of the, the important things about arts education is that it gives people an opportunity who don't fit in a box to learn in other ways. Yeah. And you know, I think that's really vital. And it's unfortunate that you have administrations when Reagan became president. I mean, he cut so much of the funding from the NEA. Right. You know, before that, I mean, in the 70s when I was in school, the, I, I grew up in Akron, Ohio, we had a program like music and art. Um, and I was in the first class of that. And it was, it was really great because it was a very creative time. You know, we could do, I had a whole access to um, a lot of opportunities creative, creatively like that. Um, but that was at a time when you didn't have to be in this this testing environment. I wouldn't have got graduated from school, you know. I wouldn't because I didn't learn that way. You know, my sister was a valedictorian, but I didn't take any AP classes because I I had certain kind of learning challenges that um, you know interfered with certain certain kind of educational. Um, whenever, you know, I just had trouble with certain things in school and you wouldn't know it. Um, but I, I learned how to use my talents and, you know, learn in different ways. And that, that's, as an educator, that's yeah. always been part of, of who I am as a teacher is to find, each, each student's different and you find what it is that you can pull out of them. Like, you know, they, I, I tell parents when I, when we, we do the first interview is like my goal is to do, figure out where their strengths are and keep building them and find ways to just keep on initiating and um, encouraging them in small increments to get better without deflating their their self-esteem you know that that and everybody's different every student learns in a different way you cannot put them in a box mm -hmm. and you know to to insist that everybody have exactly the same curriculum with no veering if you only do these tests, if you know, if you only learn this way, then you know, it leaves people out. That's true. It leaves people out. That's true. So we have to remember that. You come across the same uh, experiences, I'm sure. Yeah, I think that um, one, one of the 
just in observing and, and being with that whole change, right, of uh, we're in a different time now where young people are very clear in um, that they, their, their future is not binary. Um, and um, I think that as far as the education system goes, I think that I'm grateful that we're in New York City. Um, I, I, you know, there are other parts of the country where there are young people that are, that are really struggling right now. Um, but I think that it's, it, it was clear to the education system that um, they had to respond to the violence that was happening. And the fact that you know uh, there are higher um, rates of suicide for LGBT um, youth, um, and even educators now are trained in a different way. That um, there was a time that to to work in um, New York City public schools, you had to be trained in um, child abuse prevention or um, um, on on reporting, mm -hmm. um, but now. Now, you know, there's uh, school violence prevention training um, and other, other um, cultural competency training that teachers and uh, not only teachers, but guidance counselors and other teaching artists have to, have to be trained in. Um, and I think that it's necessary because a lot of uh, our neighborhoods, you know, just thinking about the Bronx and, you know, uh, Spanish Harlem, um, you know, a lot of the students belong to uh, families, uh, traditional faith-based families that um, this is not, you know, socially accepted to be, you know, gender fluid. Mm -hmm. And so that, that the schools can also be a space where parents could get that mm -hmm. education also mm -hmm. to, to decrease yeah. stigma and to decrease the violence that many of our, our young people, you know, are encountering, you know. But what's great is to see when um, these young people are so hip now that they they're defending each other, right? You know? right. And they're stopping when when they're stopping the, the bullying and saying, you know, that's very homophobic right. of you, right? You know? um, and also seeing young people being able to go to their prom and dress however they want to dress, mm -hmm. you know, and and be gender nonconforming. You know that that that's that's artistic expression also. Right. You know, course, just being yeah. just being who you are. Yeah. Um, but what's also I think encouraging is seeing that um, the A is being put into STEM. So I like right. when when mm -hmm. we see STEAM. Right. I'm oh. like, yes, yeah, STEAM. You have to put the arts in there. <laughs> so that's what it is. Yeah. 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 You know, oh. so it's science, technology, and uh, engineering, engineering, and, and mathematics. Yeah. But the arts, you know, we need to have the arts in there. You know, and study after study <laughs> shows that students do better academically. You know, when they have programs like music and they have, you know, visual art and uh, and theater. You know, um, so I think I think I have hope, uh, even though with our current occupant of the White House, the first, one of the first things that he did was cut funding from the NEA. Yeah. You know, so uh, I think that the self-determination mm -hmm. is we need, we need to stay on that. <laughs> right. Yeah. There's right. a, you, you guys That's know right. who Howard Gardner is? Yes. Uh, so he, so he did, intelligence. Right, so he, yeah. he did Project Zero as a 15 year project and I, our uh, class in New England conservatory was part of that and I had a roommate who was in that project and I was a subject <laughs> but uh, you know it, it is very interesting I mean part part of the impetus of that was to, to dispel this myth that you know the, um, the testing is the way to go there, there are other ways to go you know um, but you know that was in a period before Reagan you know it started I, I forget the, the exact beginning and ending dates, but um, you know, I was in Cambridge in the 80s, so. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, the, the, there have been, been periods of time where, where people do projects to prove what we already know, you know, it's, it's cyclical. You know, we don't have to keep proving this. It's just that you, it's just, like 
put the megaphone out again because of these ridiculous drastic cuts that presidents do and you know and whoever's in in the senate you know all the right. crazy political conversations that go about funding for schools you know who, whoever's in office is going to determine what the arts are it's like we're you know and so that's why we have these community programs and right you know um, going, we have to go outside of the box to, to keep it alive, keep, keep the fuel, keep the oxygen. Yeah, you just mentioned that uh, that really s stood out. The phrase that you used, uh, that you said that you passed on to the students, that you own your own education. You own your education. You own your you own your own learning. You own your own mm -hmm. learning. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah, that seems to be the premise of what the three of you. Saying in general, in reference to uh, what you've been observing as far as the changes in education and how your own experiences relate to that. Yeah. And, uh, and on, you know, multi level thing that that is. Yeah. You, know, and, uh, you, you view the same uh, dynamic with poetry because you said that. Uh, you were told that these students, quote unquote, wouldn't write any poetry, but then they ended up doing the exact opposite. Yes, and and also, you know, in their own voice. So yes. I, I always tell my students, you know, use all of your languages and codes. You know, you can mix languages if you speak another language at home other than English. You know, whether that's, you know, Spanish or whether it's Arabic. You know. Um, if you're from Yemen, um, and right. and you could create, you know, you could create that uh, in your storytelling, and, and and it's it's magical. So that's what right. they would do, and um, and I wouldn't emphasize, um, you know, um, punctuation or spelling, or it's, I just wanted them to be creative, um, and then. Um, there are other ways that I um, actually last you know, two summers ago I had the um, I got a grant a resiliency grant to work in Hunts Point um, out in, and to um, take a project out into the community mm -hmm. to talk to young people about climate change and um, so and I, and I wanted to do it in a trauma informed way because a lot of young people have a deeper sense of the catastrophe that we're really in um, more so than adults mm -hmm. and um, just being sensitive to um, that Hunts Point is is a community where uh, more than 50% of the of the students in the, um, public schools in like PS 48 in, in, in Hunts Point actually are in transitional housing Wow. Um, and and and, and that there's already so. trauma there on different mm -hmm. levels. So mm -hmm. to yeah. go out into the community and say, hey, little ones, let's talk yeah. about climate change. <laughs> um, I did it. I, I wanted to just be sensitive to that. So uh, so I wanted to. My father, my grandfather was actually a piraguero. Mm. He sold piraguas, and I wanted to create, um, ha you know, build a piragua, a piragua cart, um, and to have the ice be a metaphor and, and an incentive. Like if you write a poem, you can get a piragua. But I didn't have the time and I didn't have the resources to create, to build a piragua. Uh, and then I realized that that was really labor intensive because you have to shave the ice. <laughs> you know, so I was like, I'm gonna do popsicles. Popsicles for poems. So I created a lollipop and so I had a little shopping cart and I would go into the park, into Hunts Point River Park and Barreto Point Park, which are beautiful parks that we have in Hunts Point because the community fought to have access to the waterfront. Mm -hmm. And uh, my father actually, um, in the 80s, my father had a bodega mm -hmm. right across the street from the spot for his youth house. Mm -hmm. oh. And my family, uh, so I, have a, 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 I grew up near Gun Hill Road, but I also uh, feel really connected to Hunts Point. And my grandfather lived on Bryant Avenue right. where he sold his pitaguas. Right. Um, and this was in the 70s, you know, when the Bronx was burning. And, mm -hmm. um, but that project actually was a big hit, um, going into the park. And uh, 
Uh, and I got smart about the popsicles because the first time I went out, I went out with the popsicles on the wood sticks and they melted. <laughs> and it was a mess. And I had to give the kids, like, you know, I had 60 cups, so yeah. they, they drank popsicle juice. <laughs> <laughs> but they were, they were Four, so happy. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah. And the poems that they wrote were not just about climate change, but the climate change that's happening in their lives, you know? Mm -hmm that their inner, we talked, we were able to have conversations uh, about the, what is your inner climate, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and some young people wrote about gun violence and other mm -hmm. forms of violence and other things that they were worried about and, you know, and happy poems too, the things right. that they loved about their neighborhood, the things they loved about the Bronx. Mm -hmm. Um, and I got better with the popsicles, I would just get the sticks, the icy sticks, mm -hmm. um, which are a lot easier. Mm -hmm. But that was, I was able to collect, to get um, not only uh, young people, but some adults um, to write, mm -hmm. um, to write poems for me. And then I collaborated with another artist um, who actually was collecting garbage, mm -hmm. uh, washing it, and this was from the neighborhood, washing it, um, putting it into a blender and making like a mulch and then making tiles mm -hmm. that people in the community would then like paint. Mm -hmm. And we created, we collaborated on, on an exhibit, mm -hmm. um, and that bringing bringing art into the public spaces, especially into our green spaces, I think is um, important. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. And, uh, yeah. And, yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, having community art projects, mm -hmm. right, I think, is great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, com community. You know, we lose community every time a big building goes up and takes away the bodega, you know. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, all the, the work that was done in the New York Restoration Project, you know, in the Lower East Side, and, you know, continuing still today, you know, the community efforts of building the gardens, building mosaics together, you know, any mm -hmm. kind of community project, you get to know each other, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, life is relationships, and, you know, we, you know, Social media is supposed to, you know, connect us. So it actually makes people more isolated because they hide behind their devices, mm -hmm. you know. And so to get people out together in the sunshine, mm -hmm. interacting with each other, coming up with creative ideas together. I and mean, I love murals. You know, I've, I've done group projects like that, you know, myself, and, and it's just very empowering. I mean, you know, when you're when you're an artist, and I mean, there, it's empowering for you to, you know, be in your solitude and create a great piece of art that's crafted well and that touches. You know, everybody has their own process. That's incredible too. But the collaboration, whether it's in music or doing a mural or some whatever it is, a theater improvisation. We used to do that when I was in Cambridge a lot. Um, you know, there's that connection, that connection, um, you can't, you can't, uh, I don't know if the word is, I'm losing my words, it's, you can't match it, you know. Mm -hmm. Can I say also say something about what my poster said about um, the students being in transition, in the transitional mm -hmm. housing situation, which doesn't really get talked about very much mm -hmm. about our our New York City public school kids, particularly in the Bronx, mm -hmm. um, it is really, yeah, there are parts of Brooklyn as well. Those are the two major areas that um, have these students that are not in a home environment that is stabilized. Um, and I remember when I was young, it was like, if you weren't in a stable home, it meant like, oh, not both your parents are there. But now it's like, you literally don't have a place to live. Mm -hmm. And having you come and share this art with them must have meant the world to them because that's, that forms community for them somehow because they don't have a community. They are constantly moving around and probably not making much of a community in any place that they stay. Mm -hmm. So that too is really important, I think, about art. At this point in the reality of our students, mm -hmm. 
that the art does make for some kind of bringing together of groups of kids to, to make something positive. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, I, I'm, I'm very well aware that kids in the Bronx, there's a tremendous number of them that are homeless and or are in the foster care system yeah. <laughs> and that they find almost a, a ray of light with the arts programming that that gets offered to them. It's very often the only thing that actually has them engaged in school at all because I, I always try to think, I can't imagine being in this situation where you just never know when you're going to have to pick up and move and go to a whole nother different situation, school or whatever. And I'm, in our organization, Bronx Arts Ensemble, we have teaching artists that will literally tell us these stories about, oh, I had this great kid in my class and three months later he was gone mm -hmm. because he was in a transitional situation and the, and his family had to move, or, you know, so um, it's, it's so it's so important for the kids beyond just like oh it's important to expose them to the arts yeah. it's it's almost something that helps them to feel like they have stability mm -hmm. in a way because it's not an academic course where you're going to be judged on your test scores or things like that yeah. You are, you're going to have this experience that can be life changing and make you feel grounded almost. Mm -hmm. For those kids in particular, I think it helps a lot. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. It does, and, and I just and we're in a real crisis because, uh, according to statistics, right now in New York City there are more than a hundred evictions every day. And it's probably more. It's probably more than that. And, and, I, and like, I hesitate to even use the, the term transitional housing because some of them are in transitional housing for years. Right. Yes. You know, if it's truly transitional, then you're supposed to end up somewhere and yeah. stay there. Right. Exactly. Well, you know? isn't it funny that, like, um, Park Slope didn't want homeless shelters oh, yeah. in their neighborhood, but now it's moving in the middle between Gowan and Park Slope. A uh, uh, new hotel being used as a homeless shelter. Oh. Is it put too many hotels? It's $5,000 <laughs> exactly. for one unit that's being, that we pay. It's so economic warfare, without a doubt. Yeah. You know, complete with rationales as to why it should exist, you know, which is, the interesting aspect of that whole thing. Well, I, wa I wanted to mention something that like, you're talking about taking, you know, you taking the poetry into the street. That, that, that's just a great project. And I was thinking about, um, you know, in the, in the 70s, and graffiti, you know, on the subways was a big thing. And uh, my very distant cousin, Henry Shalfant, did the graffiti subway art project and um, and he right. he started documenting the subways and you know the kids would go into the uh, into the rail yards in the Bronx at the end of the, and, and they would do their work and then Henry would sit on the subway platform and he'd see a train go by and say oh well, that's great and he would sit for hours until it, the two train went all the way to New Lots and came all the way back. And that was before panoramic photos. And so there would be certain train stations that the, the, uh, the train was there long enough that he could get all the sections of the train and then he would create it. So that's how his thing did. And the reason I mention it is because, so this is a period in the 70s when the Bronx is burning. And there's a lot of in, uh, instability, you know, with that specifically in, in the world, um, but that specifically keeping to the conversation in New York is that here, these kids, they had a creative outlet. You know, it's like, 
um, expression of oppression. You know, if there's a, oppression, then you're going to have expression. There's always more expression in these periods of oppression. You know, and and thanks to style wars um, that came out, um, you know, where he videotaped these. Um, uh, you know, hip hop artists, and you know, captured what Ed Koch was doing, and uh, you know, denouncing graffiti. You know, um, that there was all of a sudden there was this validation that the, you know these people were real artists, and they had something to say. You know, it's like wake up, administration. Look what's happening. Why did you take the hospital away? On, what was it, 131st Street? Or you know, it's like that was. Like that was the one place African American doctors could get a job, you know. I mean, so there's so much happening in New York City that was oppressive, and you know, not having money, you know, having the police department cut and the sanitation department cut, and you know, I mean, I wasn't here, but you know, I know people have been who are here, and you know, you can read, but you know, just to see how much devastation there was. And when you have a child growing up with that, you know, how do they get, how do they get an anchor? How do they feel like they have a place that, that they are going to grow up alive? I mean, still today, you know, you know, parents wonder if their kids are going to make it to adulthood because of what they're put against. You know, you know? graffiti artists got blamed for making the life, you know, life in the city, ugly and dirty. Whereas, you know, this phrase, uh, Bronx is burning. I'm from the Bronx too. The Bronx is burning. Who was burning the Bronx? It wasn't the people who lived there that was Land who was burning the Bronx. It was the real estate interests right. who were burning the Bronx. Oh, right, 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 but again, right. they would point their finger at graffiti artists yeah. and say, "Look at these people, artists," and when calling them names. Oh, they're not real artists because real artists would be painting wouldn't be painting in that way. But then, so we have all this clash about. Again, I love this discussion because as you know, you know as it kids, you, you know, so the art thing, you know. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, you know it, these things happen slow. You know, it's like I always think about um, a forest. Mm -hmm. and you have these grand trees, and then they get knocked down, mm -hmm. and then. And then millions of little trees start growing up, and you know whenever you know things are knocked down, whether it's you know the economy, the political environment, whatever it is, we, you know people are going to speak up. Mm -hmm. and, you know th that's what gra grassroots comes from, right? Sure. And and you have so much creatively that comes out of that. Well, Lower East Side during the '70s, the city arts, city which, arts? Which, which did all these murals that. Show the oppression, budget cuts, and everything, mm -hmm. and all that. Um, in uh, part of the city arts, was in the, it was available to keep the summer program going for um, mural painting. Mm -hmm. oh. And it was very broad. And uh, in Viva La Sada, Marnice Mombe sort of documented all those murals. And recently, well, I mean, you know, I participate in a secret drawing class, the only class available for drawing morning, afternoon, evening. And as a small businessman, person, where um, Minerva Durant runs this program, and she's a brilliant artist, but I had to use her to make a speech in front of the city commission about the murals that ironically have, you know, budget cuts are now, I mean, gentrified the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Right, right, so, exactly. So, ironically, I mean, small businesses are going because of these gentrification mm -hmm. and so on, and then having Minerva as an artist, you know, getting artists together as a community, like surviving for artists to survive in a space. Right, well the Homesteaders Act was, was oh, um, you guys are from right, but I mean, yeah. you know, that, that was something that allowed artists to, to yeah, stay in their home. Yeah, but when Bloomberg came, there were only three uh, 
squatter or seven squatter buildings, but he really determined to get rid of the squats. Oh, yeah, that that brings up, there's a return of I know some murals on buildings now. Is it the same thing? No. Or is it or is it an attempt by the same people engaged in displacement to try to use art or is it a yeah, a function like of combination. A, a, a combination or is it a function of I think it's a combination employing people to create art or is it a combination of all these factors, you think? In Albaria there's a lot of murals there. Yeah. Well, in my neighborhood, I, I don't live in the Bronx anymore. I live in in West Harlem. Um, there's a lot of murals there too, but that was kind of, if you look around, uh, many of them are of birds. Yeah. So that That's was a, actually um, uh, yeah. an initiative that was was done by a nonprofit organization to put all these bird murals all over the neighborhood. So. Um, I think they just wanted to actually just get more public art in public spaces, but right. but it probably that you like the birds. I do, I yeah, do. Nice. Mm -hmm. But but I do see that it could actually lead somebody to believe that it's a nicer neighborhood than it was before. <laughs> so particularly making it a, a gentrification yeah, issue. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, there weren't people running around 20 years ago when I moved to the neighborhood doing all that kind of stuff. So, um, it's, it, it's an interesting thing to look at, but yes, we do have more public art in our neighborhood than we did before, public visual art, but, um, and this comes up all the time about actually a, the lack of public performance spaces, on the other hand, yeah. is a big problem. Yes. So we don't have places to actually perform in West Harlem, which continually is a problem for me. I would really like to perform in my neighborhood. Right. <laughs> so so um, that's something that came up a lot when I served actually on my community board um, I was on the Arts and Culture Committee and, as well as the Youth Education Libraries Committee and bringing into the whole um, community, be community benefits agreement that we had to go into with Columbia, we still don't have the, the performance spaces that we need to have in, in West Harlem. We have Riverbank now. We they just have a brand new. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's been there for a while, but but I, I mean, I, if I was to get to my own public gripes, I sure would like to find a, a performance space that actually has a piano in it, and I, and I don't have a whole lot of choice. <laughs> right, it's not really a performing space, so we still have this issue, and and I, you know, I think us as performing musicians sure. are coming up against this problem way more than we used to. Yes. <laughs> right, and then you have women. Mm -hmm. Women have been performing with you. Sure. This is totally off topic. For sure. <laughs> nothing to do with murals or anything. It's, uh, I, I kept thinking about your one statement you made in the, when you were introducing yourself about how you were told that you couldn't do certain things. I, I can't remember that you're exactly what you said, but like they said, you don't belong in this genre. This is what you're supposed to do because you're an African American woman. Who, you know, you're, you're not supposed to play viola. You're not supposed to do all the things you were told. But were you told that literally, or was that implied? And did you, or did you interpret it that way, or internalize it that way? I, you, you know, I think it's been all of the above. So you were literally, people would literally tell you, like, what do you think you're doing? I mean, uh, what do you yes, think you are? exactly. And, you know, now in my, like I said, more of an administrative aspect of, of my career, I end up going to conferences like for NISCA. Oh, we all get in the same room. We talk about how come there aren't African-American musicians who play in classical orchestras like they should be. We keep having the same discussion over and over again. I 
kind of decided I'm not going to those things anymore uh, because it, in my mind, the, the only way to really get to the heart of the problem is for me to get the, the students of color, the, the music education they need to get to that point. So we still haven't, we haven't succeeded with getting the instruments in the hands of the fifth grader like it did for me. And so um, this is a problem that still perpetuates, I mean, I can tell you when I was playing all the Broadway shows that I played, I was year after year would be the only person of color yeah. in, in the pit down there and you just, it That's just funny. feels wrong. <laughs> so do you feel like your, your, your roadblocks and negative um, experiences were more from the vantage point of being an African American as opposed to a woman? I mean, I mean you can say both, obviously. Putting it together is, makes it even harder, but I don't know, is it, can, it, you, can you separate it at all? I, I think in this situation, there's more classical string playing women mm -hmm. than there are African American mm -hmm. players in general. Mm -hmm. so, so, so I would say that the, the being African American was much more of an issue than actually being a woman who happens to be African American, um, and you know, and not not even in just those situations where it's like going for administrative jobs. And uh, I know this is being recorded, but I'm going to say it, realizing that many times I was not getting the administrative job position, executive director, or or you know, director of whatever, because that organization, nonprofit arts organization, just didn't have any inkling on how to deal with an African American as part of their team. Mm -hmm. I could feel it. Mm -hmm. It was like, okay, I came and I interviewed, and this is not going anywhere. I came with all these great ideas, but because this is kind of like not the makeup of your team, you don't know what to do with me. <laughs> so, so I would like walk out and know this is not gonna happen. Even though I'm fully qualified to do this job, there is nobody else of color here and it's probably not gonna happen. And you know, along the lines of the Create NYC initiative by, um, the Department of Cultural Affairs with, with Commissioner Finkelpearl, he fully acknowledges that this is still a problem. People of color are not in charge at, at nonprofit arts institutions. And I just don't know how the heck to make this not be. <laughs> I, there's something about, I felt like there was something about the comfort level of having somebody who, who was a person of color almost like interloping into the area like where it had never been before. Mm -hmm. I don't know when that's gonna stop. <laughs> I'm curious though back to like as a musician. So let's say in your experience in the jazz world, do you feel like that it what what would have been your experiences have they been more from the vantage point of a woman than an African American as far as being feeling like you're not one of the guys and you know you have to really prove yourself or where 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 what's been a deficit for you there or I mean the, the or, or well Park. you haven't even actually mentioned the most highest deficit is is because I play the viola so yeah. again <laughs> I do whatever I yeah. want to do yeah. so I you know that's actually not supposed to be a jazz instrument, and I don't actually care. I could uh, so, I could, I could yeah. Yeah. But she plays the cello, so it's not the viola. So the viola is the outlaw of everything. So, I mean, I think all of us violists have this thing that we're all just like, nobody ever thinks that we're going to do anything, so we just do whatever we want. <laughs> so we yes. just like, make our own bands and right, right. form our own organizations. Yes. And honestly, I, 
at one point somebody in Juilliard and asked me this question because I was doing consulting for them for three years in their educational outreach program said how come there are so many violists that are in charge of non-profit arts <laughs> institutions <laughs> in some There's way no <laughs> and, and, and it's right. not, I don't think that it's not that we don't have gigs. Everybody assumes that there's always a need for real. That, 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 it is a little bit easier than being a violinist. There's not as much competition. But my response was because, I said, because they don't think we are doing anything. But when we're in these positions where we play, we are actually controlling everything. We control the rhythm. We, we control the dynamics. We control the harmony. We control everything from within, but nobody sees that. And it's so funny because another person asked me the same question in the past month, and I told them that answer, and I still believe that. But um, as far as jazz, I mean, it was always assumed that I was a singer. I'm like, well, yes. no, I'm not. <laughs> yes. I, I, I'm like, I, I'm I got girlfriends. Oh, right. Singer, so, or singer or the girlfriend. Singer or the girlfriend. So I'm like, you know, uh, and I've had people over the my entire career, like, literally, they see this instrument on my back. And they're, do you play that thing? And I finally get to the point of saying, no, I just hired to carry it around for somebody. Oh, of course I play this. So the whole viola thing is like where the biggest problem has been like as far as like in the jazz world. It's like, what? You're playing jazz on viola? Same thing came from the classical world. It's like, you know, not only are is it outside of what we do, how can you even do that? It's you're not like Stefan Grappelli, you're not Ray Nance, you're you're not a violinist. You're you know, so you're not supposed to do that on the viola. So again, yeah. self determination. Sure. I don't really care what anybody thinks about it, I just do it. <laughs> you know, I, I, I have to say, I, this is really interesting. That's why we're here. You talk about being a singer, I mean, people thinking you're supposed to be a but singer. I always Chris, think And that. Chris, like, yeah, yeah, I know what that feels like, because I, I am doing a, I'm putting together a digital presentation for, uh, I'm going to, I was invited to, to speak on a panel about women in jazz and uh, in Hong Kong, of all places. Uh, I'll probably do protest photography while I'm there as well, but, which is something I do do. So, but uh, and and I'm going through my archives because I'm going to also do a separate digital presentation. Because when they asked me to be on the panel, I'm like, well, I'm not an academic, so let me just emphasize my photography and my experiences. So I'm going through 35 years of work on that old, and uh, and I'm I'm finding more women that I photograph than I ever you know realized. However, in jazz, you know, particularly. But there are many, many gaps. And a lot of them are singers, but a lot of them are instrumentalists. A lot of them are horn players. A lot of them are, I mean, not a lot. Several are drummers, fewer bassists. Um, you know, several, of course, a lot of pianists. I'm not, I, I feel like there's not, it's, it's pretty balanced. I, I'm surprised, you know, maybe because that's more, you know, the last 10 years of, of photographing. Um, but there are two, <laughs> this is on record, hey, wait, turn, this is off record. <laughs> no, there are two major events that I shoot every year. Um, one I don't get paid for, the Vision Festival. The other one I get a little bit, they're not probably just the uh, Jazz Foundation's fundraisers I've been shooting. You turn it back on. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can turn it on. You turn it back on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, yeah. But my point is, I'm looking through. I'm looking through those, and now with the Jazz Foundation, like their Lost series and the Apollo, they always try to get these. You know, they get rock and blues and all kinds of. I mean, you know, I photograph people I never thought I'd photograph. There, uh, Keith Richards and, uh, you know, there's uh, uh, a woman. Uh, what's her name? The opera singer Renee Fleming. Oh. And uh, last uh, the last one, uh, Patty Smith, you know, 
but and I'm not going to put those in because they are really too far off um, from this purpose of what I'm going to do. But but there's I I'm telling you there are not many women that they have had at their loft parties and at their great night in Harlem Apollo up on the stage except singers. Mm -hmm. And I start when I started going through the you know years and years of work and, and looking you know trying to find those images, I was like, you know, this sucks. And I, I am a big supporter, and I, you know, I adore, and I'm good friends with Wendy Oxenhorn, who's the director for many years. But, well, the musical, the person who's choosing all the, the groups now is a, is a man, and, you know, his world that he's traveled in for all these years. Um, I don't know, maybe he just doesn't know a lot of fierce women instrumentalists that could be leading their bands up there. Well, and we need I, to have women in charge, women hire women. women. are in charge of that organization, they have been. But they hired Steve Jordan, the drummer, to, to be the musical director, you know, well, maybe like 10 years ago, he didn't used to, but it is still. And then the Vision Festival is kind of the same way. There are lots of women that play in bands, Right. But how many leaders at the Vision Festival? Don't get mad at me, Don't get mad at me, But it's the truth. You know, I'm learning. I'm, I'm not learning it, but I'm, you know, re real, really realizing that on a big level. And then putting and this together. I mean, I, I can speak from my own experience is that if you're... <laughs> no, definitely not many, many. I mean, I'm fighting the guys. They're all, like, pushing me out of the way. I, oh, I'm going to tell you, I get that used. You've been there when I get. You know how upset I get. I, I remember. I lose yeah. it, and I'm not very like cool, calm, and collected. I get pushed around. This is not a time to be cool about no. depression. I get pushed around by those white, bald men from Europe all the time. They are always picking on me. Okay. Always picking on me. You know, like they come because they're bothered by all the photographers, and they come to me, and I'm the one who doesn't go. You know, do you ever see me go up, and you know, in front of the stage and get up there and. I don't do that. I'm like, I pick my seat, I sit there, and then sometimes I get up and move around gingerly. Well, there's nothing to be bothered about. They do it basically because you're women, you know. I'm sure of that. I'm absolutely sure of that. It's a parallel dynamic with, with, uh, with racial oppression, you know. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, you all know that. I had to say that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, then, you know, for being a, a band leader and being a composer, I have so many times been pinpointed as the girlfriend until I get on stage. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember this, this one gig I did, and you know, somebody said that after me. It's like, oh, I just thought you were somebody's girlfriend. And then you play, you know? <laughs> and, you know, and, and, you know, being, um, you know, a leader in a group, and it be assumed that somebody else in the group was the leader, and my name not even being on the bill, and I'm running the, the band. Wow. You know, th this, you know, not being mentioned in magazine articles when I, you know, was, the whole group was my idea and I run the show. You know, that, it's just, it's something that happens to women that it is not assumed that they're the leader. Right. It's just not, it's just not the go-to thought in people's mm -hmm. minds, even by women. I mean, women oh, yeah. will assume the, ma oh, the man is oh, in yeah. charge, mm -hmm. you know? It's yeah. not just men, yeah. you know? And we, you know, we have to continue to fight for that. And, yeah. you know, I, um, you know, women are not each other's best friends, I have to say, we are. <laughs> we do not help each other the way we're supposed <laughs> Yeah, we need to support each other. Yeah. Luckily, we have people like, like Abby London. Well, Parker. I was just gonna bring up, in 1999, I, I helped produce a French film here in New York City called Femme de Jazz, Women of Jazz. And again, it was over 20, 20 plus years ago. And uh, whenever I screened the film to audiences, the women always say, damn, nothing has changed. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah. You know, when, when they start to discuss, you know, the things in the film that the women are talking about as jazz artists. You know. Well, I, you know, okay, so uh, 
I, pr I produce American Women Composers mm -hmm. Marathon and Festival of Women Improvisers in the Boston version. And when we, when I was in American Women Composers, we actually had somebody in the group who was a suffragette. Mm -hmm. This woman, wow. Minuetta wow. Kessler, in the concert, she'd wear these Victorian-like dresses, <laughs> long um, uh, embroidery, and the, the lace that yeah. goes up like this. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I so I've met people who actually fought the same fight that you know the conversation we were having in the yeah. 80s, yeah. the conversation that we yeah. were having in the 90s, mm -hmm. the, the conversation we're yeah. having now. It right now. doesn't yeah. change. It, hasn't changed. it it yeah. moves up, and then and, you know it's like Sisyphus yeah. times mm -hmm. ten. Yeah. You know, it moves up and then goes way back, and you get 45 in office, and you know then it goes back a hundred steps. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. It's it, it's something we have to continue to fight and support each other. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and, you know we need movers mm -hmm. and shakers. Like mm -hmm. you know, you're you're documenting women in jazz. You're you know you have feminist jazz <laughs> film and mm -hmm. now celebrating women composers. And you know, I, I did want to mention something that when I was in American Women Composers, um, there was a split. It, as far as why uh, we did these performances. Because we had a combination of women who never had opportunities to perform, but were amateurish, you know, like pretty good singers and, you know, sort of okay composers. And then you had people who were professors, professionals, higher um, status as artists, you know. And there was a split about whether we should make it a big tent for everybody or if there should be some kind of standard of performance. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I'm just curious what people think here is like today, are we at this place really where we can, um, you know, do we want to keep it big tent? Because we do have to, we do have to, to show that women have value that there are great artists, but how many women never get opportunities exactly. to perform? Yeah. You know, it's the same question, isn't it? Yes, I, I, I have to say something too that I've noticed I, when I'm looking back in my work. And it's, it's terrible not to say this, but I'm thinking about when we can say on this panel, like, I don't want to sound like I'm bitching about things or bitter, but. Believe it or not, I'm just thinking about you know you said women support each other. We, I've been hired by more men to do to work for them, to do C D covers or studio sessions. Very few women. I think I've shot one C D cover for one woman in all my career. Mm. I've shot gigs like for you yeah, and this and that, but standards. Yeah, but and you know, other women, but very, very few women have hired me. And I'm always wondering why. You know, are they more comfortable? With a man, or do they think the man can make them feel sexier for their their CD covers? You know, believe me, I can do that. <laughs> you know, I'm really good at, at that. But I don't know. I just feel like is that a, is that a, like where we sabotage each other? Because they know I'm here. I mean, I'm not out there constantly like saying, you know, I don't go up in their face and go, hey, why aren't you hiring me here? Why don't you hire me here? I, I don't. Maybe that's what I don't do. You know, because I'm just not. Because maybe I, it's part of me being a woman that doesn't feel comfortable being, you know, that aggressive about about promoting myself. But, right. I mean the, yeah. the the challenge that we all have experienced probably um, is that when you are promoting what you do and I you know as a composer, you know, you want people to do your work. But they think it's a proposition, that it's an invitation for um, you know, something it's not music, mm -hmm. you know, and it, you know, it's insulting, it's disrespectful, and it's it's demeaning. It 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 cuts into your self esteem, and it makes you not want to go out there mm -hmm. and and try to find work because right. you're you're met with this, you know, it's it's Hostility. degrading. Oh. I, no, it's mm -hmm. degrading. I mean, I've yeah. had I've had experiences where I'm showing my work and then. You know certain things that people say or, or suggest for me to do. I mean, oh, yeah. pretty blatant things. It's like, 
So should I do the recording project now that you've said that to me? Or you know, sh should I let a go of this career opportunity because you're behaving like that? Or you know, like what what are you supposed to do when you you've got people who are are more famous than you and who can give you an opportunity? You know, now we have Harvey Weinstein and Me Too. It's like, mm -hmm. how many people in the jazz world are actually speaking up a about lot, that? Not a lot did, <laughs> but not but that kind of faded really fast. There was a whole lot of articles and conversation and groups formed online and this, that, and the other. And like, what happened to that conversation? That kind of just fizzled out, you know? And there were certain jazz musicians, that, men that got, you know, that, that were being reported to have been sexual harassers. And a lot of people started getting uncomfortable with that. Probably a lot of women did, not just the men, you know, colleagues. But wow, that fizzled out. I, I bookmark There's some a lot of, of complicity. You, want to see. <laughs> it's, you know, it's yeah. complicity. And I don't think, I, I'm, I mean, hopefully with the Me Too, you know, there's more awareness, but, you know, being firsthand experience, it, it's, it's very difficult to, um, to do your work when you're faced with these um, issues, with interpersonal mm -hmm. issues. With so, yeah, in positions think, of power. Um, the um, presenting woman in jazz in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. like, who's going to be your audience? Woman in jazz performance? Oh, I have no idea, but I think it's. It, I mean, for, what, what, why are they well, it's a, it's a, no, it's a new, it's a brand new um, cultural district center complex. It's huge, it's got everything theater, dance. Um, music. Oh, so um, it's a big music. It's a, it's a big, com no, it's a huge cultural district in West Kowloon, which I've never been to Hong Kong or Asia, so I, I don't know much about it, except oh. that is a, but, oh. but, the, but they're, they're, they're uh, one of the new spaces is called Free Space, and, and they're having their first jazz festival. Oh. And they were looking for a couple of women here that they could bring over there mm -hmm. and you know represent women in jazz or talk about it. the other woman coming from here is the um, musical tour manager for the Smithsonian Jazz Orchestra. I didn't know anything wow. about her. Mm -hmm. And then there's a, an academic there, an Asian woman from local who's, I read her bio, she's an academic and apparently I think she's a dancer too or something mm -hmm. else. But yeah, they're gonna. I don't know. It's just gonna be about gender issues, and and because of you know my comfort level was, I can talk about show my work and talk about my experiences and and highlight women, give women a a voice there, show the women, show history, yes. new young Document, in between. Right. You know, that's what I want to do. I mean, that's one of the you know great great things about you, Enid Farber, honor. <laughs> This woman's work. I mean, mm -hmm. you've been doing this for a long time, and we wouldn't. <laughs> I'll be, I'll be you know, we, <laughs> you know, we, you know, we, we owe you a lot for <coughs> documenting. You know, we really do. We do. I appreciate that. Well, I mean, you come yeah. across similar problems with, with poetry. Yeah. Yes. And, 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 and with that artistic. <laughs> The problem of male domination. Yeah. 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 That's it. 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 That's the, the patriarchy that we internalize and that we're, um, and this has been written about, you know, that as, as little girls, we're not given the same type of opportunities as boys to learn how to compete in healthy ways. So yes. um, that whole cat thing. Um, but what I've also <coughs> noticed, and this is going back to the question that you asked about um, the big tent, you know, I think it is important to have uh, experimental, uh, multi-genre performance spaces for women to be able to 
uh, play and discover themselves, discover them yeah. th themselves as creatives yes. um, and in, in, in multiple genres, mm -hmm. which is why I, I still love to um, curate and host open mics. Um, and sometimes, you know, um, there's this question in my mind, you know, uh, when I'm up, up in Barrio Poetics setting up the chairs and maybe not as many people come out that night because it's cold or it's raining outside and I'm, I'm asking myself, why am I still doing this? Like, I'm in college, you know? Like, I should have outgrown this, <laughs> you know? What am I doing? What is the point? And then, um, then you remember the point. <laughs> then I remember, then I remember, like, this is how I found myself right. and yes, how I found yes. my voice. And then I also get annoyed if, uh, you know, on a good night, mm -hmm. if most of the people that sign up for the open mic are, are, are the guys. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, and I'm like, what's going on? Am I a man magnet? Mm -hmm. Well, hey. <laughs> <Yeah. you know? laughs> but I don't want to be a man magnet. I don't think it's that I'm a man magnet. I mm -hmm. think it's that not that much has changed, that not enough has changed because um, a lot of the young women are afraid, right. you know, and uh, or are still being socialized. We're still being socialized to, to, not, to not, you know, have our voices be heard. Right. So I think that the arts and multiple genres is important because it, it gives young women that, 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 that opportunity. Um, and we have to continue to create that space and create the relationships. And um, I was looking up a name because I wanted to remember the name of the actor, the young man um, who just won an Emmy two nights ago. He 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 got oh, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Yes, um, uh, uh, Jarrell Jarrell oh, Jarrell. Oh, yeah, uh, he played yeah. like Corey Wise. Yes. yes, yeah, he played like Corey Wise yeah. in, um, in in When They See Us. When and they see also. Us uh, played um, oh, a supporting amazing. role in the movie Moonlight. Oh, yeah. 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 But he was up against Benicio Del Toro yeah. Yeah. and Hugh Grant, yeah. and he won. Yeah. So if, yeah. yes, and more. So yeah. if you haven't seen that, you know, look it up and look up his speech because it was so it was moving. So great, right? And he That's talked so about he talked about you know what it meant for him growing up in the Bronx to be able to go to LaGuardia, mm -hmm. how it kept him out of trouble. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to go to a place where people had dreams. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he talks about, you know, how the teachers encouraged him. And he, God, was he, only he 19. sounded so seasoned with that mm -hmm. speech. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like what, you know, I would have been like, ah, you know, he was just so calm, cool, and collected. <laughs> And he was just being like so authentically yeah. himself, yeah. Yes. And, and I think yeah. that that's what is um, at that's that is the reward for us yeah. as educators, and why we yeah. need to see, keep doing this thing, you know, yeah. arts education. Um, but also, that's what's at at stake, you know, that there are so many more um, young men and young women like that that need those type of, of opportunities. But that is a glimmer of hope that we can tell our young people. You, this is real. Right. Like you can really be a professional artist. Mm -hmm. You know, this is not yeah. some far mm -hmm. off dream. Like right. he did this, and you can do it too. Mm -hmm. Right. If you want to ha li make your living as an artist. You can. Yeah. Right. You know, you yeah. can. And I think I also want to mention another um, group that I'm a part of, um, Open Hydrant Theater in the Bronx, that's doing amazing work with young uh, young people of color. They're doing Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. um, they're doing um, In the Heights, they're mm -hmm. doing Annie. Uh, it's called Open Hydrant Theater, and it's in Hunts Point. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's also an adult acting class. Yeah. It's free, it's on Monday night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be fun. Yeah. Can I, so, yes, you can come too. It's, it's free. Too. Yeah. You can come, yeah, it's wow. free. It's on Monday nights. And, uh, and it's not free because it's, it's, it has no value. <laughs> But because uh, we actually have a vision and it's an ensemble and we're growing something, we're growing something amazing. Um, but um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. it's really important, as our folks are saying, to remember that uh, even though we have come up and we are established ourselves, they're just. There are literally millions of kids mm -hmm. that need to have this exposure to arts education and, and are looking 
and seeing us as and as a, a model for them. Right. Yeah. So you know, the, there's so many things as we said before. There's YouTube. There's all this internet stuff. Um, you know. We, we are real live in your neighborhood mm -hmm. influencers. Mm -hmm. We're the influencers, yeah, that's I right. hope. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> As opposed to some silly person on YouTube. Doing makeup who, tutorials. Right. I mean, <laughs> how is that influencing anybody? I don't know. But at, at this point, I think it's just really important for us to understand that, um, especially, I think, uh, me as a person of color to to be seen as as much as possible doing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, I try to go out to as many schools as I can. Um, if somebody asks me to play something, I play whatever I can. I, as I mentioned before, served on my community board. I. <laughs> which was kind of an interesting experience because especially when I was uh, on the Youth Education and Libraries Committee, there would be a ton of discussion about education as a whole, and I would always have to be like, and arts education, I'd always have to interject how important arts education was in every single discussion, mm -hmm. because it just gets exactly. forgotten exactly. as something that's of, of real meaning and yeah. importance to yeah. the students. Um, it's, it's just really important for us to keep going out and letting kids know that this is a real thing and yes, you mm -hmm. can have a career. Yeah. Yeah. You can actually have a life as an artist. And I, it just doesn't get yeah. said. It yeah. really doesn't. It's not tangible to them, you know. And, and as far as like their influencers are people that are making millions and millions of dollars and that is not exactly the reality. You can be a working artist and have a great life. I'm, I feel really blessed and happy to be doing what I'm doing. Am I a millionaire? No, but I'm actually expressing myself in ways that I wouldn't be able to if I was some kind of Wall Street banker or something who, who don't actually, I feel, many times know how to express themselves yeah. <laughs> or if they do they feel like they can't because it doesn't go along with the job description. No, no. My <laughs> piano teacher in college she was my one of my biggest mentors and um, she was the first woman to win the number in 1951. She toured China when women shouldn't be touring as musicians um, she she did amazing things. Her daughter became the first flutist of the New York Philharmonic, and um, she was a big role model for me because she you know she would say, well, just don't think of yourself as a woman. Don't put that word there. You're just doing it. You know, you're doing it because you're good. You're doing it because you're good. Um, and it, it's it, it's hard sometimes yeah. not to do that, but she is right that you do it because you're good, because you're committed. Because your talent because you deserve it because you deserve it like she said don't let people tell you that you're not good enough, that you can't do it because you're a woman you know? sure. <laughs> what was it who's that character on saturday night live you are Damn it. <laughs> they looked in the mirror and remember that character something smiling oh right what was it that was the guy you're yeah. not good yeah what yeah. Damn it, you're good enough it's right like, some affirmation. Right, yeah. right. It was so many years ago. Yeah, it's, you know, we need role models. Yeah. No, but it just made, you said, yeah, I was just thinking of, it just made me think of that comic relief. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, well, I don't know. You want to say something else, No, I was saying that I love this discussion about ed education and the arts because, um, I fell into teaching actually, just by coming back from living in Mexico with Mark Crawford, and uh, we both fell into teaching. It wasn't even something that we wanted to do initially. But I was fortunate because I was mentored and uh, got an opportunity 
to work out ideas, and it was all central, centered around the arts, because I come from a theater background. And I, I, um, I didn't know anything about methodology or, 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 oh, you should do this or that. So I already had the freedom to explore. And I was fortunate again to be in, in progressive uh, situa educational situations where we were in charge of creating the curriculum. And I started two daycare centers and I two elementary schools. Ruby East. As uh, River East and Ella Baker School and, and on, on the Lower East Side daycare centers. Uh, and, so I, and I always wanted to be in the public frame. Never wanted to teach in private school. I, I felt that there was, you know, the juice was there, you know. And again, centered around the arts because the arts were the vehicle for freedom and expression and liberation. And, um, and this is what I want, you know, felt, fell into and, and got good at. Uh, and, and had the experiences with parents and children that were extraordinary. Uh, parents saying, I don't know if I like what you're doing or even understand it. I'll give you a chance, but as soon as, you know, such and such, I'm out of here. But they gave you a chance, and you, and, you know, they were slapping their kids on the hand for, for drawing. And then I said, you know, this, this human being, <laughs> this person, this wonderful, intelligent person that you, uh, that you have is expressing him or herself, and uh, this is an opportunity to to investigate what it, what that person is doing, you know, and uh, it was just it was just one I call them miracles after another in terms of having art open up these avenues for for children and adults, and the, creating this community that we were going to um, look at what what really education was all supposed to be about and, 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 and define, define what, you know, what we wanted to uh, do. And uh, it was, you know, we're talking about these cycles. Mm -hmm. Well, this was back in the 70s and 80s and, yeah. you know, uh, up to 2012 when I retired. Right. So, but it's, uh, it was a great adventure that um, I always ch will cherish because uh, of what I discovered about myself in the process as well as a learner and as a, a, a person that wanted to be. I'm not a musician. Um, I fortunately was able to devote some skill as a writer and editor. And, um, uh, and it was, uh, you know, and Mark also discovered himself as a teacher, didn't want to be a teacher, didn't even think, you know, he went, could be a teacher. And then Miguel Aguirre uh, said to him, why don't you just go and tell them what, what you think you would do? And he did. And they hired him and he got better and better at, you know, <laughs> at doing what he did, you know. So, uh, no, I... This, this is so important, what you've discussed today, you know. It really is. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, I know that when I was born out west and grew up the age of 10, and so there was very progressive education. And when I came to New York, it was like, you're a you're middle, you know, you're an average kid. Because out there, the teachers were very nourishing. In, in poetry and, and doing the arts if you wanted to, and so on. I mean, they had open classroom situation where chairs, you, they put kids in a group there to experiment in the science project, different corners, so it'd be smaller group learning. So you come here, and the teachers were like, pow, <laughs> get to work, do your homework. And, and, and that was pretty sad about New York City. Sorry to say. But I mean, at least I had a childhood. 
Yeah. We're more expressive. And you think you wanted to save the clothes? No, I'm just excited to see both of you perform <laughs> and to see your bands oh, yeah, and definitely to bring my go. students. Yes. Yeah. Maybe some collaboration. I would love to do yeah. that. Yeah. Thank you for yeah, yeah. thank you for Thank you. Thank you. Right. Time, yeah. There's so much more to say. It's like it's well, just the, the beginning. It's <laughs> just the beginning. Before, like, it was November, December. I'm like bad. Okay. Yeah. This is yeah. recurring thing, yeah. so yeah. this is just the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate it. Okay. So it's a good learning experience for me too, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I hear I brought yeah, some archival collaborate. stuff here if anybody wants to see old programs. Or oh, yeah, that's yeah. a good to Ross. Yes. Thanks, Ross. We're putting together a group of women. I mean, being one of the serious, not, you know, you're, you don't talk, you walk. <laughs> so you we can't keep, about, like, yeah, really, we yeah, can't keep doing things here. this way. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's about y'all. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you know I, I know you for many years through the yeah. visual festival, but until I started reading your 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 postings on Facebook, oh, I God. started to really understand and the depth <sighs> of you, of you, and you're absolutely. Uh, well, a lot of it is impulsive. I look at it the next day. I'm like, oh, this is no, no, that's why it's so good. <laughs> it had to be done that's at why the time, it's so I guess. Good. Right. No, no, no. Please make keep it impulsive. That's. The only way to really write is hard. Well, I appreciate it. Well, I learned from y'all, you know. I learned from, uh, mm. you know. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, we're, I learned yeah. from. Uh, yeah, but no, it's uh, it's great to. Um, yeah. You and I all.